Hi, David and Charity back here to talk a little bit more about uh, some cloud stack networking. Uh, security groups, uh, they, they kind of came out of Amazon, the, at least the term did, but they are a uh, layer three isolation. Uh, so let, let's talk about security groups. What, um, uh, we, we talked previously that they allow a lot of scalability and uh, we have, we have uh, we have deployments where there are thousands and thousands of physical nodes and uh, something VLAN simply wouldn't scale to, uh, uh, at least not at any, not without dividing them up into lots of data centers, right? Um, so, so can you explain a little bit about how uh, security groups work and, and some of their limitations and, and as well as some of their uh, advantages? Um, security groups is a hypervisor level firewall. So, because the hypervisor gets to see every packet coming into a VM, uh, we can apply any kind of you know firewalling on that uh, on the traffic. Mm -hmm. And so, it's it's very simple. You when you launch a VM, you decide which security you create some security groups first, and then when you launch a VM, you you decide which security group it's going to be in. For example, if you're designing a traditional three-tier application, you could have one security group which says web tier. One that says app tier and one that says DB tier. Mm -hmm. Now, for the DB tier, you obviously want the most restrictive security group, which says that only the app tier can access the DB tier. Mm -hmm. And for the app tier, you want uh, another set of restricted rules, which says that only the web tier can access the app tier. And then for the web tier, you say, well, everybody in the world, in the internet, can access it, but only on port 80. Mm -hmm. So that's what security groups lets you set up these uh, very flexible rules like these, and then you and then just so that you can administer all these, you want to say that well, from a particular source IP, maybe your enterprise public IP, you can access any of these machines on port 22, mm -hmm. so that you can SSH into them. Um, so that's what security groups lets you do. So when you launch a VM, you can say well, it's just going to be my database VM, so I launch it in the database security group. Mm -hmm. And I've also launched it in a de default security group, which allows for credit to access. So you can do kind of do mix and match of these right. groups. So, so when you have a, uh, uh, when you're applying these this uh, security group, you're effectively kind of merging some of the functionality that a firewall and a router uh, that was separating the VLANs would have. Uh, are there are there any concerns that that moving up that the OSI uh, um, layer there to uh, to layer three is is a is a security issue. Uh, no, actually, it, it uh, there is one concern in that in that because now that each uh, each or every tenant is on the can or you can have two tenants on the same subnet on the same physical subnet. Well, can they now attack each other or do we need kind of spoofing attacks? But we also take care of that with specific uh, rules to prevent ARP spoofing and IP spoofing. Interesting. So, uh, so, what what is the largest kind of uh, security group deployment? I I imagine that uh, you could get really creative and, and have tens of thousands of security groups applied in a. Yeah, t typically, uh, as I said, you know, in a in an internet scale or, or typical web workload where you have three tiers, uh, the number of rules will be you know maybe in a few dozens, so it'll have like, you know, this particular application can access that application, or you know, ops can access these ports and that on those machines, so it's, it tends to be in the, in the dozens. But what truly taxes the system is that when you say that, um, for example, that only web nodes can access the app node, and then you have, you know, a thousand web nodes, Mm -hmm. um, and then you have you know five different rules for each of these. That becomes five thousand rules in the hypervisor. So how do you scale that? Yeah, five thousand rules that have to be applied to each hypervisor. Exactly. Right? For every packet, it has to go potentially through five thousand different rules. Right. So that's where we we had to solve some difficult challenges there. So so security groups uh, security groups don't work on all of our hypervisors, right? So, that's correct. So we support we support. Uh, a number of Zen flavors. We support Zen servers and cloud platform. We support KVM, uh, VMware, Oracle VM, and, and we're working on others. What? Uh, where can you use security groups today? 
Um, you can use it on like, primarily on Zen server, mm -hmm. and you need a specific cloud service pack. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where it scales the best. Right. Uh, you can also use it on KVM. Okay. And uh, VMware will be looking into it. Okay. Uh, any does uh, the cloud uh, supplemental pack that you were talking about does that work with Oracle VM since it's based on Zen or is that? Uh, yeah, that should work with Oracle VMs. Yeah. Okay. Um, very good. So. Uh, anything else that we need to know about security groups? Um, I think uh, we're going to introduce in the next release uh, the opposite of security groups, which is security groups today will let you do ingress rules. Sure. In the next release will let you also do egress rules. Egress rules. So you'll be able to filter what goes out and exactly. control, yeah. control what goes out. So if you have a spammer who is using you know, port 25 to spam, then you can say, well, okay, I'm going to block that guy. Fascinating. Well, uh, we'll look forward to seeing egress filtering. Thanks very much for talking with us about security groups.